Good morning. Actually, it's morning for me. It's afternoon for most of you. Uh, I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor of Streaming Media and the program chair for our Streaming Media Connect events. And welcome to this year's edition of Streaming Forum Connect. We were, of course, hoping to be back in person in London, but alas, that was not to be. Uh, on the other hand, these online events give us a great chance to keep the conversations going about the issues that are crucial to the online video industry. Uh, and in some ways, uh, allow people to attend who might not have been able to attend in person. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Once again, for Streaming Forum Connect, we decided to keep things very focused. Uh, we're going to be having three panels this morning. This, again, I did it again. Uh, this afternoon, uh, focusing on latency and ultra low latency, OTT workflows, and live streaming. So I hope you can join us for all of them. You will need to uh, log out and log back into Zoom for each individual panel. Uh, if you miss anything, they will be available on demand later on, as are all of our Streaming Media Connect videos. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Nanocosmos, Cast Labs, and 3Q. And I'd like to thank, uh, as I said, everyone for attending. We received signups from more than 30 countries so over the course of the next few hours. We will indeed have a truly international event. A couple of housekeeping notes. We'll be keeping the chat open, but we ask that you put any questions that you have during the panel in the Q&A tab. That makes it easier for both me and the moderator to keep track of those questions as they come in, and then we will pose them to the panelists, either at relevant points throughout the discussion or at the end of the hour. You may also notice that there are closed captions or subtitles running on your screen. Uh, if they are running on your screen and you wish to turn them off, you can go to the bottom of your screen, click on the live transcript button, and click uh, hide subtitles uh, to get those off your screen. Uh, before we jump in, I do want to mention we do have another virtual event coming up in a month. That's Streaming Media West Connect, and that will be happening November 1st through the 5th. And once again, if you can't make it live to that, or if the timings just don't work out for you, all those sessions will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, Steve Nathans Kelly, our producer, just popped the link to Streaming Media Connect in the chat, and he will probably also pop the link to our YouTube channel in there as well. You can also find all our conference videos by going to streamingmedia.com or europe.streamingmedia.com and clicking on videos. So, that's it for housekeeping. I'd like to welcome uh, Jason Tebow, who is the executive director of the Streaming Video Alliance. Jason, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Thanks for the introductions. Uh, great to be here. It's a little earlier for me than it is for you, but still. It's, a, it's, it's right the same time Sunday. for me as it is for you. We're both on central U.S. time. Are, so are we really? Watching okay. the sunrise outside. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but uh, but thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this panel. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, in the industry about latency and low latency. So uh, just really quickly uh, about myself, I'm the executive director of the Streaming Video Alliance. Uh, we're a global technical association that uh, brings member companies together in a variety of working groups throughout the streaming workflow to help solve critical challenges related to delivering high quality video at scale. So we produce documents. Documents are available to the public. Uh, you can, as a matter of fact, we have a document that our live streaming working group produced called uh, How to Reduce you know, Latency in Streaming. So it's basically a, a look at the entire workflow. So go check it out, uh, take a look at that and see what other companies are thinking of that. But for this panel, we've got two really cool panelists. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Martin and Oliver. You guys can unmute yourself and turn your video on, fantastic. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll we'll do a couple of quick intros. I know that uh, Oliver has some slides uh, to talk about some use cases with uh, it relating to low latency with regards to NanoCosmos. Uh, and then once we do that, we'll just jump into uh, we'll just jump into the questions and, and start the discussion. So Martin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. I work at uh, in the sports team at Nordic Entertainment Group, based out of Stockholm, Sweden. We and I'm, I'm we are a uh, Traditionally, a, a broadcaster uh, in the middle of aligning our both business models and technology to the streaming world uh, with the uh, very ambitious goal of uh, becoming pan-European as a streaming company. Um, I work, like I said, in the sports area. So I live in the kind of contribution segment from studios, productions, uh, getting signals home from arenas and stuff like that. So I'm here. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. Great, great perspective to add to the panel. Um, Oliver, why don't you introduce yourself? And then um, I, I guess right after your introduction, 
let's just let's toss up your slides and, and you can walk us through those. Sure. I'm Oliver Lietz. I'm from Nanocosmos, founded Nanocosmos in 1998 already. Uh, we are working in the video industry since then and now our focus is on ultra low latency live streaming. So let me share some slides, what we understand with that. So our live streaming platform is NanoStream Cloud, which is an interactive live streaming platform for ultra low latency, which means for us one second latency end to end glass to glass. It's based on an ultra low latency network CDN with a global scale and a unique player with additional tools like metrics and analytics. We created our own technology called H5 Live, which we run on all worldwide servers. And the NanoStream player is running on all browsers out of the box and can easily be integrated into custom streaming workflows. So here's a typically interactive uh, live streaming use case, a town hall or podium discussion with a Q&A channel for the audience. So the, that can be either based in enterprise meeting like a management presentation or a public hearing with the audience joining the discussion from anywhere in the world on any device. The audience engagement is usually based and interaction is based on a Q&A channel, which is um, based on additional elements on the screen, like a chat, similar like we do now in this uh, Zoom uh, session, but usually based on the browser then. And this uh, use case has gained much more momentum in the pandemic case in the last couple of months also extending to the virtual space, which would then allow people in the audience also to join the discussion directly uh, by sending back video um, to, the, to the whole audience. So that's um, a similar setup here, which is um, a different use case, which is an interactive live concert. So someone is uh, doing a live performance on the stage and directly interacting with the audience um, and chatting with them. So they are sending back their cheers and uh, questions and, and love to the performer. So here you see the, uh, uh, the performer and the artist directly interacting with the group, with the fan group. And that's a great use case for fan engagement based on entertainment and live music. There are several other use cases. Um, I just mentioned webcasts and town halls, a lot of monetized use cases like sports betting, live auctions and gaming are driving interactive use cases where it's really important to keep the latency very low or ultra low and even doing sales channels for live retail is an important growing use case for interactive live streaming. So all, our, all these use cases are based on the idea that the latency stays very low near real time to drive the interaction between the audience and the presenter. You see some uh, values, some, some real values of latency values, which you see based on different protocols. So traditionally for OTT and TV, you are using HLS and Dash, as you might know, with longer latency, which can go very high and um, does not allow interactive use cases. There are um, things like low latency HLS and CMF. We'll come to that in the discussion probably. But to be interactive, you really need to be very low or ultra low in the range of around one second or lower. So what's very important as well is to get some metrics to um, really understand the quality of service and quality of experience for the interactive use cases. And uh, as it's usually based on a global scale, you need to have full insight on the workflow um, to collect metrics like buffering or frame drops or whatever that impact on the user experience might be on the audience side. So that's the introduction for me and let's join the discussion together. Sure, okay. thanks, Oliver. Yeah, that's uh, it's very interesting. And, and I think that, you know, that kind of leads us into our first question. You know, obviously uh, from a panel perspective, we've got two different, you know, roles, right? So Martin's on the contribution, you know, side where we, we see a lot of new contribution protocols to reduce latency like SRT, uh, like RIST. So we're seeing a lot of those as they relate to stream, which is great. And then NanoCosmos, obviously, Oliver, you guys are on the other side of the house, right? Really focusing on the end user and the viewing experience and sort of reducing the latency there to, to promote, you know, some of these really new interactive streaming models we're seeing like, honestly, like gambling and betting, right? Really exciting for, for a lot of people. So I think that's really cool. Um, so let me start uh, with this question. And, and Oliver, maybe you can, you can kick us off here, but, you know, is... Is latency something that every video use case should be concerned about? Um, you know, or, or or are there are there 
use cases that just really do, you don't care and you shouldn't invest any money in reducing latency. And then on a second part of that question is, is where in the workflow should we focus? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And what we learned is that uh, latency is um, created by any part of the workflow, starting from the camera, going through the live encoder setup in the studio environment, wherever that is, uh, first mile, but also the middle mile, the whole network, the content delivery, and also the downstream to the players. So um, for interactive use case, it's really important to have uh, control on everything on the whole workflow. And then in the end, it depends on the use case, what you would like to accomplish. So low latency is usually um, also ki kind of a range. So it might be some, some uh, industry um, actors even understand latent low latency that it's lower than 10 seconds, which might be surprising. So, and usually comparing that to an OTT experience and a TV set where you would like to be as close to real time in terms of not being behind too much uh, behind the uh, TV signal to for the hearing audience, but that's not really interactive yet. So it's more still like a lean back experience uh, in these OTT scenarios, which might be sufficient then for latency values of around whatever three or four second values. But it's um, uh, if you would like to have interaction, you, you really need to go lower then. So it, it really depends on what you would like to achieve need to carefully select your technology stack and platform provider for these uh, purposes. So Martin, you, you described right now what you guys are doing is is, <laughs> is really transitioning from traditional yeah. broadcast you know, to streaming. So from, from the contribution perspective, how concerned are you with latency at that part of the workflow, sort of content ingest, content acquisition, you know, and, and what are you guys looking at and thinking about in terms of, you know, how to reduce that so that so the downstream that latency is not there. Yeah. So, so we we really have to be concerned about or or think about what's the cost of low latency. Do do we pay for it in 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 dropped packages or <laughs> short small shallow shallow buffers? Uh, for certain content, we can accept to have longer latency and uh, <laughs> an increased stability. For example. But it, whereas for sometimes, particularly if we're going to contribute to a studio production uh, from an arena, for example, then latency is definitely something that's uh, a concern and we, where we would favor low latency instead of other things. You know, I, I think it's interesting, both of you guys, even just that first question, you both talked about this, we're, we're sort of getting around this concept of the business case for reducing latency. So the idea that if you're running a streaming service, you're like, latency must be zero. You know, you're spending, well, it could be a lot of money for really no benefit for some use cases. I think that's that's really important. Um, and actually, so Martin, you talked about this kind of arena content. So obviously, yep. you know, entertainment sport group, you know, <laughs> you guys deal with live sports, you know, from the arena, you know, how how important are, so are, in other words, are, are you getting, pressure from downstream of you so let's say the viewer experience folks about latency with respect to content that's being contributed from arenas and 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 what are you guys do you see any challenges there that you've had to tackle in order to reduce the latency for for that specific use case which you know really is live sports streaming um for for us it, we're, we're fairly early days like i said we're transitioning yeah uh, the main pressure we have is when it comes to large tournaments, uh, when we're competing with TV views. Ah. Uh, when when there is the same content might be both on a linear channel and on a streaming service, then we have for sure something to think about. And it's we in the first part of the chain needs to do our part as well there for sure. No, I, th I think that's that's important to to remember that a lot of people I think we don't think about we just focus on the latency of the end player. But Oliver, you said it, right? So latency comes from every part of the workflow. And that's that's something like when I mentioned the paper, you know, it's best practices for reducing live stream latency. That's something that our working group like put down into a document was all of the components, when you add them all up, they could be milliseconds, but by the time you get to the viewer, it's five seconds of latency. And you're like, what, what, where did all that come from? So, you know, Martin, one of the things, I mean, sorry, Oliver, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, you know, in terms of use cases, right? So, you know, Nanocosmos focuses on these interactive use cases, gambling, betting, 
you know, town halls, you know, webinar, these things where people are actually interacting. And by the way, that live nation example is really cool. Like that, that concept of being able to interact with fans is, is really cool. But, you know, when it comes to things like live streaming for sports or for other linear channels, um, you know, how, how important is latency? Is it, is it like, is it absolutely has to be, you know, as low as possible? Does it have to be ultra low? You know, does it have to be real time? Can you talk a little bit about your experience in terms of, you know, dealing with customers who may be asking you that same thing? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, Martin brought up, brought up a good point. And as you also were mentioning, it's, it depends on who pays for that. And if you have a live sports channel, then uh, it's it might be a value that you have the audience uh, in the same time range as a linear TV, but uh, the audience is not paying for that directly. So uh, it's different than if you have a betting channel. So if you do sports betting, then uh, every every potential customer is paying money for that. And then you have a must have requirement for latency because it must not be behind uh, real time too much because you have real time bidders on the venue somehow. And that's the same for auctions, live auctions in art or whatever. Uh, if you have people sitting in a real uh, venue and uh, doing a live interaction and even um, um, having a monetized channel around that, then it's really important. And it, it just doesn't work without art or latency then. So the use case is impossible. So there's a range of um, maybe a use case where it's where it's nice to have and where it's also kind of value for the provider and for the whole user experience. But there are use cases where it's really a must have and a very strong requirement. Now, and that that's great. Martin, do you have anything to add right there? Anything, your thoughts on that? No, I've, I've, I completely agree that it, it's very much from based on the use case. Uh, yeah, I, 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 if there's one thing that I, I would love for attendees to take out of this, it's that, it's what you guys summed up right there, which is there's a cost to reducing latency. And you have to really look at like, so what do I pay for this? And you know, do I have to pay really, should I invest and pay money to reduce this? And am I going to see a business result from that? Or if I don't invest and fix this, is it gonna cost me by subscribers going somewhere else? Like going, going to broadcast television. I forget, I'm not watching the streaming thing. I'll just wait till I get home. I'm just gonna DVR this. I don't wanna watch it on my phone. I don't wanna watch it on my phone. It's just, it's a terrible experience that, you know, I'm, I'm 450 seconds behind live. I just, I don't wanna deal with it. So that that's, that's really important. I think we focus a lot in our industry on the technical aspects of latency. Can it be reduced? Should it be reduced? But we don't talk enough about the business side of it. Like what's the impact? What are the, what are the benefits I get from it as a business? And what are the costs to me if I don't address it? Um, you know, Oliver, one of the things you showed in your presentation was about metrics, right? So measuring and, and obviously, you know, you guys are using some, you guys are using some, we'll call it bleeding edge technology for streaming. Um, I, I uh, full disclosure, I co-founded a, a, a big data company in the streaming space called DataZoom. And we originally built our architecture on WebSockets. And what we realized at the time was, you know, we were, we were trying to do tens of millions of concurrent sessions and WebSockets just couldn't scale for it. So we went another direction, but you're using it for a very specific purpose, which is really interesting. And so you, you're introducing a lot of what we'll call sort of non-standard streaming components and technologies into the stack. You know, what metrics are important for you guys in terms of like keeping your ultra low latency ultra low? Um, and how, how do you how do you gather that data and, and present it to, you know, to your customers? Yeah, so we have, of course, a lot of metrics which we collect internally to keep the service up and running properly and to see to be able to adjust. But also for our customers, it's very important, not only have technical metrics like whatever buffering, latency values, uh, quality of the video, et cetera, but also uh, really have the quality of experience, the, the outreach to the audience uh, with a global scale, uh, what kind of audience size in, is in which area, what kind of interaction is happening where. So um, presenting that in a kind of API or dashboard is also something which uh, a lot of uh, customers have asked for. So we added that to our platform. There are ways to add uh, NLP platforms, uh, which you might know from other environments. But as, as we as we learned, uh, these use cases are very specific, have specific requirements, and you might need to have a solution for these requirements. So you might even go whatever hybrid. So you have your traditional workflow, 
which you don't need to change too much. You can go to millions with a live event and you might have a closed group for these fans. As I shared, the, the fan engagement use case might be for specific um, groups only where you have these additional services. You collect metrics around that, see uh, how many people were joining that, uh, what kind of interaction was happening there, etc. So it's an added value service for these activities if you consider that in the large scale. No, that's that's really interesting. You know, Martin, are there are there metrics that you're looking at specifically? You know, for for even example, for you know, how quickly is content coming from you know camera to studio or uplink to downlink or you know what what are the metrics that you're looking at to help you guys reduce latency? So, so it, it's very limited. <laughs> <laughs> not as exciting. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but we yeah, of course we we look at the the packet loss primarily. Uh, and uh, and we try and maintain buffer sizes in both decoding and encoding stages, okay. uh, and, and that's really where we where I pay attention to it. Uh, no, and and that, and that makes sense, right? I mean, and, and obviously, you know, a lot of the new protocols, the contribution protocols, you know, obviously, TCP has its failings, which is you know obviously why a lot of a lot of data transfer is better under UDP. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, but it, but so packet loss makes a lot of sense. Like where, where did a packet drop? Okay. How do, you know, how do we fix that? Where's the error correction? Um, all that stuff. But that's, that's very interesting to hear that you guys are looking at things on the contribution side that again, flow downhill. Um, yep. and, and, you know, you mentioned the buffer. And so Oliver, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this. There, there is a, 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 a very close relationship between latency of streaming and the buffer. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Kind of explain to our audience sort of what that relationship is, and then, you know, e even that is—is is there a way to sort of optimize, you know, to to ensure that closer to real-time playback can happen, um, or or interactivity even can happen at scale? Yeah, sure. So for interactive use case and latency, buffers need to be as low as possible. So that's why it needs it needs a bit more intelligence than um, compared to kind of a passive player which just pulls uh, streams from anywhere. You need to have that under control and adjust. If buffering happens somehow, then you might need to drop something or reduce quality with adaptive bitrate, things like that. So um, th that's a kind of a bidirectional activity then and uh, requires intelligence on the player and on the server part, but also for the contribution part. Um, the, uh, the signal needs to be as high quality as possible. So um, you can't do anything if if that's already lost. So having a good uh, network in the upstream is very important. And um, technologies like SRT are able to somehow adjust to packet loss, but it's always better to not have packet loss at all and to have a stable connection, TCP connection um, with high bandwidth. Uh, so you can send an upstream with highest quality possible. You can reduce buffers on the interest side then, and then uh, you can adjust um, to the downstream by reducing quality or whatever uh, based on this high, higher quality reference signal, which is always great to have. And in studio environment where you have a sports production, for example, you have that reference signal somehow. And if you can maintain that in a low latency in the interest part in the production side already, then you have uh, solved the first part in the uh, delivery chain already um, to be able to to enable these use cases. So, and do you do you work with your customers? So, so obviously, right, the the player buffer is intended there to to capture content and allow the viewer to keep watching in the event that a connection fails, right? So, you you have, for example, you have longer segment sizes. You can fill up the buffer with more content. The connection goes down. The, person can continue watching while the player is working feverishly in the background to reestablish a connection. Um, but that puts you way behind live. So you reduce your segment size down to, you know, near nothing and you fill up your buffer with hardly anything and you have this real live connection and you're getting this almost instantaneous feed, but the instant the connection drops, like that, that's the circle winning spinning wheel of death. Um, do you do you talk and work with your customers to sort of figure out what's best for their use case and help them optimize, you know, even packaging or segment size or anything like that to sort of help them optimize the buffer? Yes, we do. Absolutely. And it's important that you understand the use case and the requirements somehow. So is there a trade-off or is there an acceptance to maybe allow a bit higher latency? 
that it might be three, four seconds or so for any kind of use case where the focus then is on the highest quality of the delivery. So there might be a trade-off then. So if it's, uh, but if it needs to be low latency, then you might need, to, or the player uh, technology, the, uh, the use case might need to require that you need to drop some frames or reduce quality of the video or even disable video. So you only have the audio, the audio channel running. And that is um, different in kind of lean back experience, full screen, uh, high resolution 4K um, streams where you just want to watch a fluent show and with the highest quality possible where you can accept the higher latency. So there's a kind of a trade-off between these th things. No, and that's good. I mean, it's kind of, it goes back to that cost of latency, right? So it's looking at your use case first, what latency is acceptable for my viewing experience, right? So, I'm, so again, it's so like for you, like I'm trying to get to interactive, right? It's gambling, it's battling. The, okay, so the, the, the acceptable level of latency is near zero. <laughs> like, I can't have latency when I'm playing poker. I can't have latency when I'm betting on horses. Um, that's important. And so I, I, again, one of those things I want people to take away from this, use case, right? So it's not a one size fits all. There's not a just you have, you should have two to three second latency period. No, like it, that's, you're not going to get a benefit for use case A that you are going to get for use case B. So that's, that's really important. Um, Martin, one of the things that we're hearing a lot about in the industry right now, of course, is, and I got to do some dramatic music, da, 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 5G. Like, so 5G is going to improve latency. It's going to solve world hunger. It's going to make, you know, us go to Mars. I guess it's going to fix every problem in the world. Um, but we hear a lot of it about it in streaming. And I know that, you know, here in the U.S., we're seeing a lot, we're seeing some of the big providers like Verizon deploy ultra wideband. So that's the millimeter wave 5G technology in arenas. And, and this is, Oliver, I'm going to give you a chance to answer, but this is just some really cool stuff. That enables, of course, really cool use cases. But we're also talking about five, you know, basically 5G enabled cameras on site to deliver content faster from a contribution perspective. Where is 5G sitting with you guys? Like, how are you looking at it as technology? Is it, do you feel that it's going to solve potentially or improve some latency kind of at that beginning part of the workflow? Um, which will eventually turn to streaming. I don't, can you give us your thoughts on, on all of that? Yeah, I think, and, and I'm purely speculating here. Oh, sure, no, no, sure, um, sure. speculate <laughs> away. <laughs> but uh, for me, 5G, or, or when that, we go to an arena with uh, a streaming setup, a backpack and a camera or something like that, uh, or even better, an encoder <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a camera, we, uh, first mile is my problem. That's my worry. And, and here is where I think 5G can, can provide a good solution uh, and a good alternative for uh, the kind of uh, where we get interla internet lines provided by various telecom operators uh, by the, at the arenas. It's all temporary. It's where in, in Europe, uh, it, it's very expensive to get speeds above ISD hand speeds. Uh, so, so, and it's primarily intended for audio and, and not to carry video home. Uh, and, and here I see 5G as being a game changer. When it comes to latency, I, I think uh, I, I would keep an eye on it <laughs> for sure. And I think there will be some, some benefits to it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the hope is that not just... Um, a larger amount of bandwidth available, right? That, yeah, yeah. That's great. But it's really about the way that the mobile operator can partition and utilize the network on a 5G network to, to improve like round trip time and responsiveness. And, um, yeah. you know, uh, Oliver, what are your thoughts on, on 5G? Is this, this a game changer for interactive use cases where people are out with their mobile phones elsewhere? Um, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. The Actually, we were starting working with uh, live streaming when we needed to work on 2G networks years ago. <laughs> so and we have heard the same promises about 3G in that time. So it's, um, and, and that was of course mandatory to have at least 3G for video. So, so that was what was step one, let's say. Then we had uh, 4G LTE and now 5G is more kind of an organic um, growth in these things. So 
for higher quality video, you need uh, higher bandwidth. And what, Mart what uh, Martin was mentioning, what we experience also from uh, uh, people using um, video in, in whatever location, studio venue, uh, uh, sports venues or wherever re remote locations, where it's always a problem for the upstream to send the proper video out. So uh, things like um, channel bonding for combining different SIM card providers and things like that, that might be easier to handle with 5G because you need a certain um, bandwidth and latency to send out a proper signal. So that's, that's the, that's, let's say the, the, the contribution part. In the distribution part, it's a bit similar, but that's not so much a big of challenge. It's more like having the network um, distributed everywhere. So if you are commuting, commu commuting somehow or traveling or whatever, you want to have the full experience wherever you are. So um, having 5G on just some spots is also not enough. So it's uh, then required to adjust to the locations. And the other thing maybe, which might also be a, a new use case coming out of the 5G um, setup might be user-generated content from a mobile phone, for example, which then enables higher quality for anyone. And yeah. things like fan engagement and interaction between a lot of uh, larger groups then might be much easier to handle, which are still challenging for existing technology. Yeah, that, and, that's, and that's where I think, that, I think that's the most exciting part to me. The, you know, it's, it's funny when we think about how much what's the what's the quality of video you can watch on a phone right so people are like let's deliver 4k to a mobile phone no you're not going to notice the difference between 4k and 720p stop wasting your money sending so many extra bits but the real use case for mobile video is interactivity and it's being a part of that sort of of a larger community like interacting with each other while watching a video or being part of a fan experience or live sports and so i think Oliver, that that you, you really hit that on the head. I think that's where 5G, with with its very fast round trip time, with with Mech, so mobile edge compute, having a cloud right there next to the device per se, being able to carry out you know computations and things there. That's where 5G, I think, is really going to excel for for sort of the streaming industry and again, just very specific use cases. Um, you know, Oliver, you, you mentioned in your presentation again, sort of the the HL5. So your your, I guess, it, it's not really a protocol. It's a, it's a, a delivery method, a delivery architecture. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And 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 I I kind of want you to talk a little bit, if you can, about some of the protocols that streaming is is experimenting with right now, right? WebRTC, Quick. You know, you've got obviously WebSock is not a delivery protocol. You know, it's it, a window connection method. But you know, can you talk a little bit about those protocols and sort of, you know, what you're seeing in terms of interactivity and how they're applying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were starting working for interactive uh, video applications, whatever, ten years ago or so, when still RTMP wasn't the game, which was somehow uh, possible to use these. Um, these pick up these use cases based on its protocol with the flash player in this time but with a growing um, audience based on mobile handsets it's more and more um, important that you have immediate access on the browser on any device and so we looked around and uh, thought of whatever hls protocol dash protocols or these segmented protocols they were just not designed for interactive use cases so uh, it's uh, in the end we needed to decide to create something on our own to to be able to achieve these interactive use cases for the for the end users and for our business case our customers were asking for. In terms of WebRTC, we also early on picked up this technology. We found it quite challenging, quite complex, also in terms of scale and uh, also device compatibility around uh, whatever. Um, uh, laptops, desktops, but even especially mobile devices in, in hostile networks to keep the uh, quality of experience high enough. So um, what we then also noticed and learned was that in the end, um, what partners we are working with don't care too much about the protocols um, and needed us to decide what, what to use then mm -hmm. for them. So to have a solution which is running somehow out of the box and but is still um, lightweight and easy to use. So we, we did a hybrid approach then. We did a combination of um, low latency HLS technologies, web sockets, whatever is available on the device and decide on the right technology stack to, to use what is available. And then um, 
somehow cover and hide the technology challenges so um, the implementation part and application can can rely on the video being stable in the in the video element on the page so that's uh, several layers of um, architecture you need to consider here and it's not only the protocol itself in the end you need to cover uh, whatever global range uh, scale uh, level of interactivity compatibility um, where where is it running etc so there's a lot of challenges around that yeah that, that's 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 exactly you probably it probably take you a lot of hands to count the challenges but it, it's you know yeah you've got to consider scale you've got to consider you know how compatible is this with smart tvs and connected devices and mobile phones and browsers and laptops and it's just the list goes on and on and so that's that's interesting to hear you guys talk about that you know martin obviously there there's lots of there's there's almost an equal protocol war on, on, on the contribution side. You've got SRT, which people seem to be getting behind. You've got RISC, and then you've got HESP. And so there's all these like protocols. What, what kind of decision-making process are you guys going through to settle in on a contribution protocol uh, as you transition to streaming? Yeah. Uh, for us, it's been very much a, a listening exercise <laughs> to, to see simply see uh, <laughs> To, to monitor what's going on in the market and, and uh, what we get questions about. Because in for us, we don't, most of the times there will be a service provider or a rights owner gotcha. who provides the encoding step. So we kind of have to talk to them, agree on a, some kind of middle ground most of the time. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's really about, the, we're, we're back to the, to the business side of things yeah. where we have to listen to what, what is required from from the, uh, the ecosystem? Now, no, no, no. if that would be wrist, that's fine. We go wrist, you know, or whatever it could be. No, that, that's important. I mean, I, again, I I think sometimes we we look at technology decisions made in a vacuum, but yeah. they shouldn't be. But they should be made in conjunction with like what you described that that sort of ecosystem. Yeah. Um, you know, Oliver, one of the things that we're kind of seeing in the streaming industry right now, and, and it's it's funny, what is old is new again. Um, is is peer to peer, All right? So we're starting to see you know peer assisted delivery to help with latency, right? And 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 that makes sense, right? So it's obviously a way shorter round trip time if I can pull it from my neighbor's, you know, seed. He's seeding some peer. If I can pull it from his peer versus having to, you know, jump all the way back through the hoops um, through my network provider and get it from either cash or from origin. And, and we're starting to see now these sort of hybrid environments where it's commercial CDN plus peer to peer. Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Is this something that plays any role in sort of how you work with customers or are you guys looking at, you know, how NanoCosmos works within those environments? Can you talk a little bit about that and then, and then sort of what you feel like is the real impact of, of improving latency in terms of, of using hybrid delivery architectures. Mm -hmm. So we, we get some questions around the, these topics, especially for enterprise environments, not so many anymore in the pandemic situation, obviously. But um, to be honest, we don't see a big benefit for interactive use cases or to just uh, avoiding interactive use case because you have the traditional CDN, which already has long latency, and then you put the peer-to-peer uh, -peer delivery behind that. So it, it always adds latency on that. So it has um, benefits for large scale distribution within, within closed environments in the enterprise networks. Um, but I don't think that that's a benefit which um, would improve latency here. So, um, and the, let's say web RDC based um, technology, which is usually peer to peer if you have two parties speaking uh, already connects to a server if you have a larger group and then it gets server-based anyways again. So, uh, and the peer-to-peer -peer delivery is something different. It puts uh, the HLS um, chunks into another chunk, which is sent out via WebRTC again. So it's a complex um, technology, which has um, advantages and scale in the enterprise space, but um, not necessarily for latency, in my opinion. No, that's interesting. That's, and, and again, that's good to hear, right? I think there's, there's not a definitive this is the best thing ever. Everyone should use this kind of approach. It's it's really people experimenting. You know, does this really improve the viewing experience? And back back to that cost thing, right? The cost of latency, right? Is it worth like the cost of me deploying a hybrid architecture to get X benefit? Um, 
that that's that's really what streaming operators need to think about. Um, so, I, so I, again, I, I like we keep going back to that. <laughs> um, you know, Martin, one one of the things that was interesting during the pandemic um, is we saw a lot of like we saw a, obviously a hiatus of of sporting content, right? Live sporting content. Um, what we saw during that time though was a lot of studios move to cloud-based workflow production. Um, so traditionally, where we used to have arena to truck to um, you know some sort of editing facility right so the truck would go up the satellite down to the downlink facility editing distribution out to local nodes broadcast um, now we're seeing a lot of that go into the cloud and being done yeah. remotely um, has has there been an a positive impact on latency a again sort of at that ingest acquisition contribution side um, and then, you know, is that something that you guys, like, in your opinion, do you see that continuing? Um, and will will that have a benefit for for latency? So content gets into the workflow, into the streaming workflow faster. So what we've seen is that these cloud-based workflows have definitely proved themselves during the pandemic. There, there's no argument. Uh, where I see they've been most successful is when it has been possible to adjust existing workflows to fit that, that environment. Uh, it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Uh, we will at some point go more towards the cloud. I will not say that everything will be in cloud, <laughs> uh, but it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on and it's a super interesting development and there is a lot of good work being done in that arena right now well we'll, we'll go we'll go back to cost again <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly just sticking everything in the cloud yeah. probably not the most effective use of resources so you're not going to see the best roi from every component in the cloud some you're going to see a great roi yeah. others like you're better off not putting it in the cloud. Um, so that's 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 interesting to hear you guys talk about that because it I, I I think from from my experience within the SVA we we've seen companies move in that direction um, and and they've got a lot of benefits of being able to get the content faster from acquisition yep. to playback. So it's like you cut I mean I mean good grief cut and 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 then cut out the cost of up and down link with yep. satellite transmission. I mean. That alone saves you a ton of money. Why, why didn't I put this into the cloud 10 years ago? And, um, and where, where cloud really shines is to if you compete with, uh, say, several satellite hops, it is super interesting to maybe go on an AWS backbone. Absolutely. And, and traverse the Atlantic that way. It's, yep. it's very interesting, very, very appealing. Well, and, and, and again, we've talked about the migration of, you know, of, of that that side of the house to IP for what, the last 25 yeah, years? Yeah. Get get away from SDI. Can we just use our IP networks to move our content around? Um, that, that I, I, and again, for me, understanding sort of streaming, that movement is going to be a very huge impact on latency in, in terms of what Oliver described at the beginning, the whole workflow, right? I wanna get my content not only to be delivered better, but to get to the user faster, like sooner. I want, I want my content in the market sooner. Um, so that, that's another kind of like aspect of latency that I think we don't talk about enough uh, as well. Um, you know, Oliver, you had talked a little bit uh, uh, earlier on about LLHLS, like you mentioned that in your slides. You're like, hey, we're gonna talk about that later. Yeah, now is the time to talk about it. <laughs> um, you know, what, what does package selection have to do with overall latency like is is you know in other words what do providers have to keep in mind when choosing a format you know is it is like everyone should be ll dash everyone should be lhls you know there's a there's a benefit to each or what you know what there's just every again we're, we're just everything's competing with each other right now to say that it has the better impact or it's the better package or format or encoding or you know whatever what what are your thoughts on on what's going on with packaging and what you know what do providers need to think about yeah, well, there's no one fits all solution. So um, for the Apple space, you need to do HLS and for other browsers, you might do Dash, but that's still somehow high latency as I would call it. It's uh, starting maybe at three or four seconds and it has some value for these use cases where you might have a reduced latency. 
I would call it uh, not low latency, maybe reduced latency. And um, it's, but it's not only the protocol. So, and then, then it's getting complex. If you have several um, tech stacks uh, competing with each other or also in your application and need to implement everything uh, then yourself, uh, then it's really something you usually don't want to worry about as a business who just wants to add, just let's say, okay. uh, just wants to add live video to their application. And uh, that's what we learned. That's uh, why we built up our solution. We know all the details about um, these protocols and had partners working with that, but the challenges remained. And I think they are here to stay. Okay. If you just uh, care about these different protocols and want to implement everything yourself. And we built up our own cloud solution for a reason. That's not um, uh, not to just invent something new. It's, uh, it was a reason which uh, the industry was asking for to cover these technology challenges somehow and uh, enable live streaming in a, in a global scale and easy to use way somehow. So it's it's a very it gets gets very hard to when you go into these details and when you care about packaging sizes etc. Then you need to adjust very carefully and you can uh, it can create create a, a great impact on the whole user experience if you do something wrong here. I always tell people that streaming optimization is like a giant panel of a thousand knobs and you turn one knob and you don't realize the impact it has on a bunch of other knobs that you have to turn to adjust so that they all stay in balance um and it it's you're right it's optimizations like i'm i'm just going to change my segment size or i'm just going to change my package type or i'm just going to change my format or or i'm going to implement some changes in my profiles and my encoder all of those optimizations have downstream impact um, and and you really do have to test them carefully. I think that I think that's a, a really good point that we tend to lose track of. It's more just, oh, CMAF has a low latency. Let's just use that. Okay, we're done. We've solved we've solved the problem. N not not necessarily. <laughs> you may have created new problems elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I think that's again that's I'm glad that you brought that up because that is really important. Another great takeaway people should think about is. It's it's not a one size fits all. Latency is something that you know has to be massaged and optimized at every point within the workflow. Whenever you make one optimization, you have to look at the impact on everything else. Um, that's really part. Actually, you, you you made me think. There's a really cool like I can imagine this matrix in my head of you know there's normal streaming and then there's reduced latency and then there's low latency and then there's ultra low latency. And you have like a table and you check the boxes for your use cases, like which use case requires which latency. And again, it's a, it's a business decision, not a technology one. It's not just, we have live streaming. This should be reduced latency. There should be yeah. low latency. There should be, no, it's it's about the use case and, and the business impact uh, of, of, of not reducing the latency. I think that's the key thing. What you, people have to ask themselves, what happens if I don't reduce latency? I mean, that, that's an easy enough question to ask yourself. And if you realize I'm going to lose half my subscribers, okay, I should probably invest in, in, in reducing the latency. Um, you know, we're, we're, okay, so we got about 10 minutes of time here. Let's turn this, we've got some questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, so I will, let's look at this first one. Um, actually, I'm going to go in reverse order. So the, the one that was submitted most recently and, and Oliver, if you can, address this first, but it, how does the small buffer affect the video quality? So from the encoder point of view, uh, doesn't the encoder have harder work to do trying to apply such as temporal compression? Yes, somehow. So if you have temporal compression in H.264, which you usually still use and use B frames, then you have a bit higher buffer. So it's, but it's maybe um, something like 100 millisecond max or so. And it depends on what you would like to achieve. So you can tune it in your encoder and upstream configuration already. You can reduce buffers if you have um, a stable network. So if the network drops somehow, even very shortly, if you have packet disconnections, whatever, then you need to have a buffer to, um, to accommodate that. But if it's a stable connection, then you can reduce the buffer and have a stable upstream, even with uh, small buffers and low latency. Excellent answer. Martin, do you have anything to add to that that you want to? I have another question for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think uh, uh, the way I, I like to look at it as the, uh, at least when it comes to the receive buffer, that that has more to do with the communication between encode and decode stages. 
uh, than the actual encode or decode. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so here's a question for you. Uh, the question is, I find it interesting that sports I see using an app are 60 seconds behind real time, while this Zoom session <laughs> is just less than 0.5 seconds behind. Do you foresee low latency? So again, this is this is the part where the, the industry as a whole, we need to define what reduced latency, low latency, and ultra low latency mean. Um, do you see that low latency operation for sports streaming becoming widespread in the future? So again, I guess that the question is, are sports operators driving towards increasing low latency? Uh, do I see lower latencies being uh, a competitive edge? Yes. But uh, there is, from, from, from a platform perspective or an operator perspective, I think you have to make the decision whether you want to push better pictures or faster. And there, there's a, an, a balance there. What, what you, where, where is your benefit? What do you win? Uh, so I think uh, the short answer is absolutely yes. I think latency will be very important in the, in the coming years. And uh, there will be a, a competition to match DVBS or DVBS2 type <laughs> latency. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. It, is there, is, is the sort of nirvana of streaming sports like ultra low latency 4K? <laughs> is that is that the holy grail? Um, yeah, I, what do you, I mean? Do, do you guys do you guys see that as being sort of a real like? Are our sports streamers driving towards that? Like, we want to get the highest quality bit rate at the lowest yeah. latency. Like, is that is that what you're seeing? We we see some some movements towards that for sure. We see, uh, uh, and for me, I, I would say that I prefer the HDR components rather than a bigger picture yeah. <laughs> yeah particularly when it comes to streaming uh where but uh yeah no we see we see that for sure yeah we, we have discussions all the time like yeah. what what you know i will take 1080p hdr over 4k like all, all, pretty much any day of any day of the week um so that, that's interesting that you say that and it's great to see a lot of streaming operators supporting hdr of course now now we're in the hdr wars right so yeah but that's a whole nother discussion um uh, you know, last question we've got here, uh, Oliver, I wonder if you can help us in, in, in this might really sort of be a question for Nano Cosmos is, you know, the question is basically, is, is there a good streaming service for latency in China? So what they're saying is that like Vimeo, YouTube, et cetera, are really not working there. What are, what are your thoughts on that? That's, that's a great question. It's a challenging question. So China has uh, issues with regulation. So as we as we learned in the last couple of months uh, that was in the newspaper, they even shut down their own uh, business partly. So it's really complex and uh, we can, on our end, we, we can just stream to, to China by um, providing this, the live stream in the public internet. So it's picked up then from whatever Asian location we provide there. But China mainland is something which really requires uh, regulation and political um, permit. Somehow you, you have to have a Chinese um, company and a legal uh, situation there to really have something in China mainland. But um, that doesn't avoid using the public internet uh, generally in China. And that's uh, what we learned is also working at least with uh, uh, somehow um, might, there might be an impact on user experience, but there is also ways to, to accommodate that. So, but it's complex. <laughs> No, and then that's that's that probably the best way to answer it is that it's it's just complex. You have the Great Firewall of China, so every every public internet stream going into China is being regulated. Like what you said, you, 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 the Chinese government does not allow a foreign-owned company, wholly wholly owned foreign-owned company. So you have to have a Chinese-owned company at least fifty-one percent, and it's just it gets really. And that's why everybody was using China Cash for the longest time, right? They were just China Cash was peering with everybody. And thankfully, you do have some other options now, like Alibaba and those folks. A lot of CDNs are coming up, which have mainland China integration, which is you know, which is great. Um, but yeah, it, it's like best way to answer it. I've, I think I've heard it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, so it, it works. Uh, generally, it works, but you have you can't control everything within the, uh, the mainland uh, situation. So um that, that's why you need to go, go that in steps maybe as well to do a rollout and do some testing around that and see how that goes now that's that's yeah that's good advice do testing do a rollout do testing um all right so we've got a couple minutes left and i have a last question for you guys um and we'll start with martin 
Uh, and then Oliver, obviously, you know, it's the same question to you, but what one piece of advice would you provide to a streaming operator who is looking to reduce latency for, for whatever, you know, really for whatever use case, but just looking to reduce latency? Um, what, what, what would you tell them? Uh, for, for me and, and the space I work in, it would be to own the whole, as many parts of that chain you can and, 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 and take your time to experiment with that in all those stages. Oh, I, I like that. I like to own, own all the pieces of the chain. Huh, that's, that's very, because obviously if you own them, you can control them and you can really, yeah. like what we talked about before, turn all the dials. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and exactly, we, 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 we all fight against the network layer and we, we can't very rarely own that. That's right. But anything you can own in the in in between, it it, it will help you. Yeah, it's always it's always fun. We used to always have discussions. Customers like I, so I worked in the CDN space for a lot of years. We'd have customers come to us saying like, "What what you know? Can can you help us optimize the the last mile?" Um, no, we're a CDN, okay. not an ISP. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Go, go go talk to the network operator. Yeah. Like they control that pipe. Um, yeah. But it, it's you're right. The more you can control within the workflow and in those components the better you can optimize it. Um, Oliver, what, what are your thoughts? What, what piece of advice would you give? Uh, <laughs> I would ask some counter questions. So wh why would you try to reduce that? What's your use case? Uh, you mentioned the last mile. Is it the last mile only or is it the whole production uh, workflow? So there are, that's, there are some questions around that. What's the value for that? And um, then uh, it's getting easier if you have answered, uh, answers to this, this, these questions. Well, I mean, that's good. Maybe that's the piece of advice you're giving is, you know, understand the context of your question, like understand the context of why you are trying to reduce latency. I think you're right. I think a lot of people just come to the problem of like, I got to get my latency reduced. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> that's like, I got, I got to buy, a, I got to buy a vehicle. Okay. Is that a bike? Is that a car? Is that a scooter? <laughs> like, do you want to train? Do you want to want to drive a semi? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that, I think that's important. Context is important to the question of reducing latency. It's, it, it's that business value of why. So um, with that said, I think we're, we're all finished. But, you know, Oliver, Martin, thank you so much for participating. It's great discussion, really cool to talk about this topic. And, and again, I hope the attendees really took away some of that business case, business value. It's all about business value. So, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Eric. Thank you very much, JT and Martin and Oliver. Uh, you know, I keep thinking that maybe this next streaming media event, we won't have a panel or a discussion about latency, but it's an evergreen <laughs> topic. And, you know, within two or three Ever. months, even things change uh, and develop. So uh, thanks so much. That was terrific. Uh, please join us in a half an hour or so for our next panel discussion, which is about how to maximize efficiencies and minimize costs in your OTT workflow. Thanks again. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.